Louisiana, a land rich in history and resources, originally the home of the Natchez, the Homa, and the Choctaw, but the adopted home of Iberville, Bienville, and Tonti. Louisiana, the focus of international struggle and intrigue for centuries, a place of mystique, the home of a people known for distinct culture and institutions, the parish and police jury. Louisiana, that catalyst for transforming the former British North American colonists into a national melting pot. Louisiana, the birthplace of jazz, the refinement of blues and the gospel, the source of Creole and Cajun food, the home of Huey Long and Evangeline, Lee Armstrong and Marie Laveau. The Louisiana Purchase, arguably the world's most significant real estate transaction, will be the subject of this semester-long series, both on its immediate importance but its continuing impact today. Welcome to week 10 of a continuing series on the Louisiana Purchase. The lecture of this week is Professor Joe Lewis Caldwell, Vice Chancellor Associate and Past Chair and Associate Professor of our History Department. Dr. Caldwell is a member of the department since 1985. He is yet another department member who has received the Distinguished Undergraduate Teaching Award given by the Alumni Association. In his lecture, he discusses the period immediately after the American takeover in 1803, a period he refers to as the Interregnum. Caldwell focuses on the impact that the American rule had on the social, economic, and cultural treatment of African Americans, both free and unfree. His study shows how free black Louisianans suffered a sharp decline in privileges while opportunities for whites correspondingly increased. His lecture illuminates facts on economic and social opportunities for African Americans, which often put them into conflicts with the increasing influx of European immigrants. When President Thomas Jefferson instructed Robert Livingston, the American minister to France, to diligently pursue the acquisition of the Isles of Orleans, he buttressed those instructions by coasting an appropriation of $2 million from Congress to defray the anticipated purchase price. Additionally, he sent James Monroe to assist Livingston in the negotiations. Livingston and Monroe made their spiel to the French representatives and their sensibilities were shaken when Francois Barbet Maboyes, speaking for none other than Napoleon Bonaparte, offered to sell the entire Louisiana colony. Certainly, this unexpected move generated some hasty huddling between Jefferson's envoys. After approximately two weeks of offers and counter-offers, they accepted the deal profited by the Frenchmen and bought the entire Louisiana colony for $15 million. The purchase agreement was signed on May 2, 1803. However, the date on the official papers was April the 30th. The question must be asked, and it has been asked by numerous scholars in the past, what induced Napoleon to sell Louisiana to the Americans, and by so doing, dash forever the grandiose dream of a sprawling French empire in North America. Napoleon, poised to renew the struggle against William Pitt the Younger and those pesky shopkeepers of the world across the channel from France, appreciated the strategic and financial necessity of disposing of the colony. He feared it would fall into the hands of France's hated rival, the English. Reflecting on his decision to sell, Napoleon stated, quote, This accession of territory strengthens forever the power of the United States, and I have just given England a maritime rival that will sooner or later humble her pride. By the stroke of a pen, the size of the United States was nearly double. Thirteen states, in whole or in part, were carved from the purchased territory. This Walmart-style bargain basement sale brought into the territorial confines of the United States one of the most fertile river valley systems in the world, the lower Mississippi River Valley. Having purchased the Louisiana Territory from France, President Jefferson and the members of his administration were eager to take possession of the land and began the arduous process of building a Republican political order in the wake of French and Spanish rule. The transfer ceremonies were to be held in New Orleans, in New Orleans Cabildo. A round of balls and dinner parties herald the coming event. The French commissioner, Pierre Clement de La Sotte left an account of these festive celebrations and unwillingly paid tribute to the powerful influence that Africa has exerted on the culture of New Orleans. A soiree given by La Sotte on December 11, 1803 featured 24 gumbos, 
Six or eight of those were made with sea turtle. Gumbo is a West African word which means a mixture or a variety. The editors of Lasat's paper stated that the word gumbo appears in the paper several times and they refer to it as the national dish of New Orleans. Commissioner Lasat even included a gumbo recipe in his papers. He wrote, quote, and I added, first you make a roux. First you make a roux, take some meat, cut very fine, and put into your pot with a little fat and a little flour. Let it brown a little, then add small portions of onions and garlic. Not too much garlic and onion because it will smell bad. Then add much water, as much water as you would like, uh, as insofar as the gumbo that you want, and you will, you will do fine, you will make a good gumbo. If you have crabs or shrimp, you may add those also. Watch that it does not burn, and you will make a good gumbo. I forgot to add that one must eat it with rice, end quote. Mr. Lassat added an, a, an explanatory note to the recipe. Quote, the principal ingredient in this soup is okra, a vegetable whose shape resembles a large green bean, end quote. The official transfer of the Louisiana Territory from France to the United States took place on December 20, 1803. Afterwards, Congress divided the purchased lands into the Territory of Louisiana and the Territory of Orleans, and President Jefferson, following much deliberation, appointed his cousin, William Charles Cole Claiborne, Governor of the Territory of Orleans. Claiborne was from Sussex County, Virginia, and he was a former governor of the Mississippi Territory who did not speak a word of French. This disability certainly did not endear him to a population that was overwhelmingly French in its sentiments. What did these momentous changes mean for free blacks and slaves living in New Orleans during the intervening years, 1803-1811? Was their life markedly altered or did life go on uninterrupted as if it were mysteriously hitched to the rhythms of a far distant past? Did the immigration of free blacks and slaves from the Caribbean and the Upper South have an impact on the economy and culture of New Orleans? Moreover, would these changed circumstances influence the lives of New Orleans black population and their descendants, slave and free, far beyond the territorial years? On August 22, 1791, spawned by events half a world away in France, a sanctimine voodoo papaloi, a high priest named Bukaman, met with his companions on a mountainside hideaway overlooking Le Cap Francais on the island colony of saint Domingue. It was here, in an African-Caribbean religious ceremony, that the spark was ignited, which set this island ablaze. Following Bukaman's death and the death of Jean Francois, Pierre de Mine Toussaint L'Ouverture rose to a position of preeminence in the struggle for black liberation on the island of saint Domingue. Because of this cataclysmic upheaval, and the bloody conflagration which followed. Scores of white and black planters fled the bloodletting and flames of that sun-drenched Caribbean island, gathering what slaves they could as they ran. The most memorable departure of the St. Domingue refugees took place on June 23, 1793. 10,000 souls scrambled on board 300 waiting ships in the harbor of Le Cap Francais, a few steps ahead of an angry army of black former slaves and set sail for various ports on the Atlantic coast of the United States. An undetermined number of these refugees from St. Domingue, black and white, slave and free, made their way to New Orleans during the Spanish period. Another mass exodus of St. Domingue refugees came on the heels of the defeat of the French invasion force sent to the island in 1802 by Napoleon under the leadership of Charles Victor Emmanuel Leclerc, Napoleon's brother-in-law. Its ranks were riddled by the hit and run guerrilla tactics of Toussaint's highly disciplined forces. A number of Leclerc's men were stricken by yellow fever and he wrote Napoleon telling him that his army was being decimated and he would need reinforcements to swell his ranks to 25,000 in order to defeat Toussaint. His request was denied and Leclerc, after treacherously capturing Toussaint in June of 1802 and consigning him to an imprisonment and an unheroic death in a dark, dank dungeon high in the mountains near the Switzerland border, succumbed to the malady which afflicted his men and was laid to rest in a foreign land. It was the responsibility of those who took up the mantle of command after Leclerc's demise to assemble the battered remnants of a once proud invasion force and head home to France. In 1803, with the defeat and departure of the French army from saint Domingue, nearly all of the island's white inhabitants, a number of free persons of color along with some slaves, 
in all a total of 30,000 souls abandoned the island for nearby Cuba. Defiant in victory, these former bondsmen rechristened their island homeland Haiti for a Carib Indian word said to mean beautiful mountains. Hereafter, I will refer to the refugees from this infant black island nation as Haitians. Haitian refugees scattered across the Caribbean like sparks from a wildfire were again uprooted by the unfavorable winds of a war blowing in from Western Europe. When colonial authorities in Jamaica and Cuba began pressuring them to leave, they turned their eyes toward New Orleans. Between 1803 and 1804, several boatloads of Haitian refugees, pushed out of Jamaica by the British, arrived in New Orleans. Here is what one writer had to say about the number of refugees from Haiti entering New Orleans between 1804 and 1810. Quote, according to a special report made by the mayor of New Orleans, 9,059 St. Domine refugees from Cuba arrived between May 1809 and January 1810. Additional arrivals in 1810 pushed the total to more than 10,000. All three castes were well represented in the influx of 1809. 2,731 whites, 3,102 free persons of color, and 3,226 slaves. An analysis of the mayor's report cited above shows that whites made up 30.1% of the total number of Haitian refugees who entered New Orleans in 1809. Free persons of color comprised 34.2% and slaves represented the largest contingent at 35.6%. First, let us examine the impact that this infusion of Haitian immigrants had on the numerical mix of New Orleans population. An 1805 city census shows a municipal population of 8,475. There were 3,551 whites, 1,566 free persons of color, 3,105 slaves, and a miscellaneous lot of 253. Five years later, the 1810 national census tabulated 12,225 individuals residing in New Orleans. This represented a 3.2% increase in the city's population over a five-year period. The 1810 population for New Orleans showed 4,507 whites, 3,332 free persons of color, and 4,386 slaves. An aggregate of 7,718 persons of African descent gave New Orleans a black majority a fact that was sobering and frightening to Governor Claiborne and many others. Alongside this statistical ramification stands the social, cultural, economic, and political implications for New Orleans. Because of these newcomers, New Orleans roared like an overheated cauldron during the years 1803-1811. Ever mindful of the presence of this black majority, the indigenous white population and white newcomers from the Upper South and the Eastern Seaboard developed a siege mentality, dreading an alliance between free blacks and slaves that would unleash vengeful bloodletting reminiscent of the revolution in the colony of St. Domingue. As early as 1804, Governor Claiborne expressed concern about the aggressive attitude of New Orleans' Jean de Color Libre. His concern was heightened when he became aware of a letter of grievance that members of this class were planning to send to Congress. His awareness of this so-called memorial letter caused him to write a letter to Secretary of State James Madison on July 12, 1804. In this letter, he stated fully his fear that if knowledge of this letter became public, it would incite violence against the free blacks that would, in turn, drive them into the arms of the black slaves, as had been the case on the island of St. Domingue. The haunting specter of St. Domingue informed his every move as it related to blacks in New Orleans, slaves and free persons of color. His diplomatic treatment of free blacks in New Orleans and the rest of the territory was born of this assessment. In his July 12th letter to the Secretary of State, he said, quote, the letter which was handed to a printer for publication inviting a meeting of free people of color for the purpose of memorializing Congress occasioned an inquietude among the white inhabitants, which is just now beginning to subside. The municipality of New Orleans expressed a wish that I should punish the mulatto man who handed the letter with great severity and banish the author of the letter when known from the province. It seemed to me, in a country where the Negro population was so great, the less noise made about this occurrence, the better. 
This letter, which was handed to a printer for publication, inviting a meeting of free people of color for the purpose of memorializing Congress, occasioned an inquietude among the white inhabitants, which is just now beginning to subside. The municipality of New Orleans expressed a wish that I should punish the mulatto man who handed the letter with great severity and banish the author of the letter when known from the province. It seemed to me, in a country where the Negro population was so great, the less noise made about this occurrence, the better. Governor Claiborne summoned nine of the most respectful, influential, and circumspect men from the city's free black community and conversed with them in the presence of the mayor. After the meeting, the governor's fears were placated somewhat, and he accepted their assurance of their loyalty to the American government. Another issue that Governor Claiborne grappled with during the period under review was the issue of reactivating the free black militia companies. Traditionally, blacks in Louisiana had participated in the defense of the colony, dating back to the Natchez Indian Wars in the first half of the 18th century. This tradition was kept alive during the last days of Spanish power in old Louisiana. It was particularly evident after the discovery of a planned rebellion among the slaves of Point Coupee Parish, just north of Baton Rouge. The free black militia problem received a considerable amount of attention from Governor Claiborne during the years 1803 and 1806 due to the prevailing fear that war between Spain and the United States was imminent. On January the 20th, 1806, the testimony of a free black man named Stefan, who made a sworn statement charging that the free blacks of Louisiana were being manipulated by the Spanish officials and were highly prejudiced towards Spanish interests further convinced the governor that he was pursuing the correct course regarding the free black militia. In his January 13, 1807 address to the Territorial Assembly, he urged that body to recognize the free men of color living in New Orleans and its vicinity as a part of the regular militia. On January 26, 1807, the House of Representatives authorized Governor Claiborne to enroll the battalion of free men of color and assign them duties commensurate with their capacity. Free blacks in early 19th century New Orleans represented an integral spoke in the economic wheel of the city. Black women and men of this class followed a wide range of occupations in early 19th century New Orleans. They were found in jobs requiring no skills, low skills, and positions demanding a high level of skills. It is believed by scholars that the strong economic niche that free persons of color called for themselves in antebellum New Orleans enabled them to make a successful transition into a new economic order during the post-emancipation period. Men from New Orleans' free black community were primarily found working as carpenters, masons, cobblers, saddlers, cigar makers, joiners, plasters, shopkeepers, tavern keepers, stewards, barbers, butchers, and blacksmiths. According to one scholar, much of the ornamental ironwork in the Vucare can be attributed to blacks, some of whom were surely free. Women from the New Orleans class of free persons of color were not reticent about going into the world of work. As aggressive as their male counterparts, they too were found in a wide range of occupations. Into this melange came the Haitian refugees from Cuba, who fled the dying embers of the crown jewel of France's once grand array of Caribbean sugar colonies in 1803. These women brought with them the African Caribbean tradition of female entrepreneurial dominance in the public marketplace. Working alongside free black women from New Orleans, they were vendors in the public market selling sweet cakes, vegetables, and other wares of various sorts. Free women of color in New Orleans during the years being studied here sold real estate, worked as shopkeepers, laundresses, cooks, nurses, domestic servants, boarding house operators, seamstresses, retail merchants, dealers in used goods, firewood vendors, and tavern keepers. We're standing in front of the African American Museum in the Treme community. Farberg Treme was the most vibrant enclave of economic activities involving New Orleans free black community before, during, and after the territorial period. One writer stated that since the end of the Spanish colonial period in 1803, more than 80% of the land in the area between Domaine and St. Bernard from Rampart to Broad had always been owned and occupied by free blacks." End quote. In a study involving property transactions in a one block area of Treme, the study covered the period from 1810 to 1840, Martha P. Irvin found that 20 properties changed hands between 1803 and 1807 in the block being scrutinized. 
Commenting on these transactions, Irvin stated, quote, of these transactions, 40% involved purchases by white men, 5% by white females, 35% by free colored males, and 20% by free colored females. There appeared to be, in 1810, close to a 50-50 ratio between free black and white property owners in the study area, with free blacks having a slight edge, end quote. Economic assertiveness and the struggle for cultural space continues to be a hallmark of free blacks in Treme and throughout New Orleans, well beyond the years being examined here. Despite the burden of enforced second-class status, free blacks in early 19th century New Orleans developed full and, com and complex socio-cultural dimensions to their lives. A strong attachment to the theater developed in the last decade of the 18th century. A company of French-speaking comedians who were fleeing from the slave uprising in saint Domingue established the St. Peter's Theater on St. Peter's Street. Following the success of the St. Peter's Theater, the St. Philip's Theater opened in 1808. Seating arrangements were segregated. Provisions were made for the free persons of color and slaves attended when accompanying their masters. Public balls and dances were a prime form of entertainment in New Orleans long before the American age dawned in 1803. Free blacks, slaves, newcomers, and indigenous white New, Orle New, Orle New Orleanians partook of these social outlets. Enterprising businessmen began promoting subscription dances and balls during the Spanish colonial era. One of the most enduring images of the social lives of free black women of antebellum New Orleans is that of the quadroon balls, etched indelibly into our minds by the powerful hammer-like blows of popular legend and lore and reinforced by the retelling on the part of serious and pedestrian writers alike. It has become entangled in the very whole fabric of the historical image of New Orleans. A few examples will illustrate this point. Frank Yerby treats the quadroon balls in a novel entitled The Foxes of Horror, 1946. He refers to them as the balls de cordon bleu. Yerby gives a description of these balls that leaves the impression that they were very formalized arrangements between young white men and very attractive young female quadroons who were supervised by their mothers. There's something nearly Victorian about this image of impending domesticity. Yerb explains in his narrative that the objective of these balls was to afford young white men of means an opportunity to forge liaisons with beautiful quadroon women. Once a match was made, we are informed, the young man promised to build the newfound object of his affection, a suitable house on Rampart Street educate and care for any children born of that union, and maintain her in a comfortable lifestyle. What Frank Yeber tells us in the work cited above became standard fare with minor variations when writers chose to treat this subject. The late Henry Comin exploded this myth in his classic work, Music in New Orleans, The Formative Years, 1791 to 1841. Comin tells us that the first real quadroon balls were the brainchild of a shrewd businessman named Auguste Tessie who was out to make a quick peso. In 1805, Tessie rented a ballroom on St. Philip Street and prepared to promote balls exclusively for free women of color and white men. In November, he announced that he would be staging two balls per week of the above cited character. The balls were to be held every Wednesday and Saturday, starting on Saturday, November the 23rd. Tessie renamed the rented St. Philip Street ballroom the Sale Chinois. And it was in this hall that the first true quadroon balls were held. According to Comin, at their best, these affairs were erotic interracial dances and at their lowest ebb, interracial orgies. It is true that a, place, that a placage system existed in New Orleans throughout the antebellum era. However, it was an outgrowth of gender imbalance and was not caused by the quadroon balls. An important measurement of any community is how well it cares for its children. Free black children in early 19th century New Orleans were nurtured in families that were closely knit and tied to larger extended networks of kinship and friendship. They were trained for the world of work by their parents, relatives, godparents, and through the apprenticeship system. In 1811, a young quadroon boy named Dauphine, who was born on the island of St. Domingue, bound himself over to a, as an apprentice to William Brand to learn the trade of bricklaying and plasterer. For his part, Brand agreed to teach his charge the above-mentioned trades and to provide him with adequate food, lodging, washing, clothing, 
medical aid, and night schooling sufficient for him to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic, quote, as far as a rule of three, end quote. It is an oversimplification to say that free persons of color were merely tolerated in New Orleans' antebellum order. Rather, they were needed economically as a buffer between a growing and assertive enslaved population. Fortified by Haitian refugees in the early 19th century, they laid the foundation for a strong community that sustained New Orleans' larger black community into the 20th century. Clearly, New Orleans' most visible and most troublesome portion of its population during the period under review was its slave population. Their numbers were listed as 3,105 on an 1805 census report for the city of New Orleans. Five years later, the federal census marshal counted 4,386 slaves in New Orleans. Frightened whites, trembling in the wake of the violent upheaval on the island of St. Domingue, felt they were being suffocated by black slaves. White New Orleanians of the early 19th century, like their kinsmen throughout the antebellum South, harbored feelings about their slaves that were deeply ambivalent. To them, the slaves were, on the one hand, simple, childlike creatures who loved them and theirs. On the other hand, they were seen as brooding, vengeful savages plotting bloody revolt. Such a paranoid atmosphere was exacerbated in New Orleans and throughout the Spanish colony of Louisiana when, in 1795, a well-coordinated conspiracy to rebel was discovered among slaves in Point Coupee Parish, just north of Baton Rouge. Subsequent trials and executions added to the smoldering concern over controlling the slave population. When Claiborne took office as governor of the territory of New Orleans in 1803, one of his major concerns was how to effectively control its restive and growing slave population. An immediate concern was preventing the importation of black slaves from the island of St. Domingue. Apparently, Claiborne believed that West Indian slaves were infected with a revolutionary virus that would spread quickly among the slaves in Louisiana. Shortly after he assumed the office of territorial governor, Congress passed a measure prohibiting the importation of slaves from abroad. However, in a letter sent to Secretary Madison on January 31, 1804, Claiborne informed the Secretary of a Spanish vessel that arrived in New Orleans carrying 50 Africans and offering them for sale. After consultation with others in the city, Claiborne reluctantly allowed the traders to conduct their grisly business. The United States Congress outlawed the transatlantic slave trade in 1807. Thereafter, New Orleans was dependent upon the domestic slave trade and smugglers for its chattel labor. In looking at the lives of black slaves in New Orleans during the years under examination, it is important to keep before us the fact that we are viewing this institution in an urban environment, not on Louisiana's cotton or sugarcane plantations. Urban slaves were more defiant, had more money, had more freedom, and they had anonymity. The custom of allowing slaves to hire their own time resulted in New Orleans having slaves within its borders who came and went as they pleased. Like their counterparts on the plantations, slaves in New Orleans were expected to labor. Slave men were found in occupation ranging from the highly skilled to those requiring only brute strength. They were boiler makers, mechanics of the first order, bricklayers, carpenters, blacksmiths, cabinet makers, wheelwrights, they loaded and unloaded the sailing vessels that crowded the riverfront daily. They were draymen, barbers, topographers, wagoners, stable hands, painters, shoemakers, and musicians. Slave women in early 19th century New Orleans were found in a variety of jobs as well. They served as midwives, nurses, cooks, seamstresses, vendors in the public markets, house servants, flower girls, and fishmongers. Slave boys and girls were employed in early 19th century New Orleans as babysitters, hotel waiters, valets, waiting men, and domestic servants. Black slaves in New Orleans between 1803 and 1811 were exposed to a far richer social and cultural life than that which was experienced by their cousins on Louisiana's cotton and sugarcane plantations. In New Orleans, slaves attended the theater, public dances and balls, the circus, and danced and sold wares at the public market. The dancing at Congo Square, while acutely important to our understanding of the black culture of antebellum New Orleans, was not their only avenue of cultural expression. Haitian refugees, slave and free, reintroduced voodoo to New Orleans. Certainly voodoo practices and conjuration abound 
in 18th century New Orleans. However, because the slavers who descended on West Africa during the high tide of the trade were concerned about individual captives, not representatives of cultural institutions. Religious leaders were not always carried away. The Haitian Revolution sent an entire community of refugees with their cultural institutions intact to New Orleans. I believe these Haitian refugees, slave and free, white and black, breathed new life into New Orleans voodoo. Throughout his short career as territorial governor, Claiborne was fearful of a slave revolt in the territory of Orleans. In January 1811, his nightmare came true. Charles alone led the largest slave rebellion to take place in the United States. While less than five whites were killed, the fact that he amassed approximately 500 slaves and maroons to march under his banner was impressive. His efforts were crushed by a combined force of free black militiamen from New Orleans, private citizens, and a contingent of United States troops under General Wade Hampton. Charles alone and about 60 others were tried, pronounced guilty, and executed by a firing squad. Their decapitated heads were displayed on pikes along the river toward New Orleans to serve as a warning to other slaves in that vicinity of southeast Louisiana. Fighting to stave off the corrosive impact of a society that openly taught that they were inferior, free blacks and slaves, independent of one another and sometimes in concert with one another, fought valiantly to build a foundation for a better world. In joining in this fight in the manner that they did, free blacks and slaves established a tradition of assertive leadership that served the larger black community of New Orleans well during the post-emancipation era and deep into the 20th century.